Salut bonjour tout le monde I've been trying to record this video for the past two and a half weeks, but the labels just kept getting stupider and stupider as the time went on. So, since today they have killed the rest of the debates on C21 in CQ meeting, I'm just gonna make a summary of the hearing on the OIC and the implication for C21 while they are asleep. So, just as a reminder, the hearings that have ended two and a half weeks ago are specifically on the OIC from May 2020, when Trudeau had a temper tantrum and decided to just ban the AR-15 and a bunch of other rifles. I believe there was 1500 models spread over about nine families of rifles, quote unquote. This is a court case that was brought by ATRS, Alberta Tactical Rifle Supply, the CCFR, and a number of private individuals as well. So, let's get on with the arguments of the applicants. So first up, we have the financial cost. As many of you know, the OIC has reclassified a number of restricted and non-restricted rifles, like the AR-15 and AR-10 respectively, into prohibited. That means that we have a lot of inventory that is currently immobilized inside of the shops. To give you an example, I talked a little bit with some of the shops that are inside of Calgary, and they are sitting, according to them, on billions of dollars worth of inventory. Inventory which, of course, has a cost also in terms of storage. Which would obviously mean that even if the government were to offer compensation for the rifles themselves, like the labels have said they would, it does not offer compensation for the cost of storage. And obviously there is also the can of worm of the loss of revenue, meaning that any compensation that would be given to the shops is not going to be anywhere near what they would actually have made if they had just run the normal operation or sold the rifles. And just as an anecdote when I'm recording this video, last week when I was at the Steel Challenge at the CDTSA, I spoke with some of the guys from the Calgary Shooting Center and they have a number of AR-15 that are from Knight's Armament. The thing is, Knight's Armament in the US is essentially not selling any rifle to the civilian market because they are busy with the military one. Meaning that these rifles that have been sitting for three years have way more value than when they were first purchased by the shop. There is also a cultural cost because the AR-15 is the most popular sporting carbine on the planet. So whenever somebody wants to enter competition or any kind of training, they have a much harder time to actually kit out or get high quality equipment because even though Canada has become kind of the king of AR-180, their performance and quality is nowhere near as high as a top shelf AR-15, meaning that our sportsmen are falling behind and the de facto ban on pistols is also making it considerably more difficult to train and be competitive. The most important though is the technical side. As the applicants lawyers have shown multiple times during the cross-examination of experts and witnesses, there is literally no difference in function between the assault style firearm or whatever the fuck the liberals are calling them these days and any other rifle in the same caliber. Meaning banning AR-15s only results in substitution, and the big problem is, the liberals have already said, and it is in the original text of the law, that if any other rifle were going to be present in higher numbers, then they would be banning these ones as well. Which means that contrary to what the liberals have been pretending, it has absolutely nothing to do with public safety or whatever, it only has to do with banning the biggest possible number of rifles. It's also very important to note that when Trudeau was saying that all of these firearms he banned were only designed to kill the maximum number of people in the minimum amount of time, that was complete nonsense because the Canadian government, through the FRT and the fact that they were either non-restricted or restricted, already admitted that they were suited for sport or hunting. More insultingly, in 2020, about, I think, two or three weeks after the OIC, the Canadian government had decided to give AR-10s to Fauna engines, which means that the government still, to this day, is admitting that they are completely suited to defense against wildlife or hunting. And now we get on to the really infuriating part, the Attorney General of Canada arguments. And I am using that term extremely loosely. So, the core of the argument is to rely on quote-unquote expert witness like Smith, which is a massive anti-gunner whose life work is essentially banning as many guns as he possibly can. That charlatan is posing as an expert and concentrates on the Australian example, which a bunch of uh, quote-unquote studies peer-reviewed by other anti-gunners. Needless to say, anybody who passed Statistics 101 would laugh this clown out of the room. 
quite frankly, the judge should have just dismissed this guy because when he was interrogated by the applicant's lawyers, turns out that he not only contradicted himself multiple times, he contradicted his own paper and his paper was proving him wrong. Specifically, he was alleging that there was no substitution by gang and his own paper was saying that yes, that was exactly what they were doing. And if you would allow a side note from me, an engineer, it does not fucking matter how many people peer reviewed your paper. If empirical data contradicts your paper, it means your paper is worthless. For example, in this case, the guy was pretending that the almost complete ban on semi-automatic in Australia resulted in the gun homicide rate plummeting. That is a fucking lie and a first year student in statistics could have called it out. The gun homicide rate was already going down, it stalled, went back up, and then started going down exactly at the same rate as before the ban, meaning that the ban had absolutely no discernible effect, other than announcing to criminals that they had full reign for a couple of years. Anyway. Their next argument is to say that assault-style firearms are inherently more dangerous than hunting rifles. However, when pressed by the judge, they were not actually capable of saying why they were more dangerous, because unless you're Jerry Michulek, you are not going to be able to press the trigger fast enough to outrun your rifle. Doesn't matter if it's an AR-15, an AR-10, FN-49, or whatever semi-automatic you have. They also admitted they were completely incapable of saying what a variant was because the RCMP acknowledged that they kept changing the definition. Amongst men of culture like ourselves, we use variant as a colloquial term. The problem is, when you try to make it a legal term, you end up with examples like the Mossberg 715T, which is literally just a regular 715, a 22 long rifle gun, in a plastic clamshell. But because it externally looks a little bit like an AR-15, it got banned as a variant. When pushed by the judge to say why these nine families, the R15, Scorpion Niveau, M14, etc., were specifically targeted and reclassified as prohibited, they also could not actually give any argument. I was almost surprised to not hear cabinet confidentiality being invoked. I'm not going to go through all of the lie by omission, appeal to emotion and other fallacies professed by the AG's lawyers because, quite frankly, there's a ton of it and you've heard all of that before. However, there are two very important points of legalese. The first one is public safety. According to the AG's lawyer, the government of Canada is allowed to ban anything it wants at any point it wants just by invoking public safety. It does not matter if it's guns, cars, planes, uh, drugs, anything really. I'm pretty sure you can already see that this is a pretty massive problem of balance between power of government and rights of the citizen. And just to quote Benjamin Franklin, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And on the balance of people's right versus power of government, the AG's lawyers had the audacity of making a point so bad I almost spat out my drink. Specifically, they pointed that the gun owner is representing only 6% of the Canadian population and people known to own this firearm at the time of the OIC were 0.5% of the population. So, the only way that I can interpret this comment from the AG's lawyer means that the government sees it as completely acceptable to abuse the citizens' rights and freedoms as long as it sees them as a small enough minority. Anyone with half a working brain has known for a very long time that the liberals were a bunch of wannabe dictators, but actually hearing it in court openly, that's a new law. But remember this statistic because it's going to be very important for the closing arguments. So a lot of the closing arguments were just a reiteration of the opening arguments in all reality. This is in part because the AG's lawyers have been thoroughly incapable of making any argument that holds water. Like I said, a bunch of fallacies, lie by omission, and a number of insults that I will go over in a little bit. However, we now have a very, very, very important point inside of the criminal code. Specifically, the 117.15 paragraph 2, restriction. This is extremely important because this is what the AG's lawyers have been relying on to say that the government is allowed to ban anything it wants by OIC just by invoking public safety. However, if you get onto the restriction, in making regulation, the governor in council may not prescribe anything to be a prohibited firearm, a restricted firearm, a prohibited weapon, a restricted weapon, a prohibited device or prohibited ammunition if in the opinion of the governor and council, the thing to be prescribed is reasonable for use in Canada for hunting or sporting purposes. 
And this is the big problem right now, because every single one of these firearms, through FRT and the fact that they are present in large number in Canada, mean that they are reasonable for hunting or sporting purposes. Meaning that following the letter of the law, what Trudeau did was completely and utterly illegal. Now, remember that statistic that I told you about, the 0.5%? Well, that's where things can potentially get a little bit trickier, because the precedent already exists for this application, meaning that the firearm must essentially not be in common use. So the argument of the government of Canada can be construed as meaning, because there's only 0.5% of the Canadian population that is targeted by these new bans, it means that they are not in common use and therefore can easily be banned. Problem is, this 0.5% also only considers the, the uh, registered firearm, which means those that were registered before. And a lot of the ones that have been banned by OIC were never registered. For example, the, um, the M305 from Norinco, essentially a uh, Springfield N1A, that's not registered. We don't know how many are actually in the country. And this is obviously also very relevant for Bill C21 that has just been rammed out of CQ meetings. Specifically, the Liberals are saying that we have all of these rules that will apply to the firearms made after the law is passed, if it is passed, obviously, but the committee that they want to form at the same time is obviously aimed at re-evaluating, quote-unquote, all of the firearms that are already on the market and banning them by OIC, which, let's be honest, it's going to be every single firearm in existence. So, if the judge were to rule in favor of the applicants, it means in all reality that the government would not be able to do anything by OIC whether the committee likes it or not. However, if the judge was to go with the government, which would still be appealed in all reality, uh, we are talking about a big problem because now the government can ban any gun at any time and nobody will know. Which means you could potentially take your shotgun, go and try to get a turkey or something, and then be controlled by a FONA agent and say, oh wait, your shotgun is a prohibited device, you're going to jail now, just because you didn't check Armalite or the FRT before you left home. Now, regarding our chances, quite frankly, I'm not particularly optimistic. The thing is, the judge clearly did not know anything about firearms from beginning to end. Honestly, to me, it seemed like she had not read any of the court documentation before the hearing started. Maybe it was just a problem of schedule, but even I, as a complete bum, had the time to read all of the affidavit and all of the available court documentation. Considering this is a case that have huge ramifications for property rights and also financially for the government of Canada and for the citizen as a result, I would have thought that at least she would have read through the documents. One of my major qualms with the way that she presided over the hearings is that the government lawyers have multiple times insulted the gun community. For example, we have been compared to drug addicts who constantly need to accumulate more guns and ammunition, comment that she laughed at, but the absolute worst comment was, quote, there is no clear defining line between gun owners and criminals. I'm not making this up, and had I been a judge, this fucker would have been kicked out for the rest of the hearing and his time given to the applicants. During the closing arguments, it was also very, very, very clear that she was far more receptive to the argument of the government, even though there were a bunch of fallacies and it seemed to me that they were taking everybody for a bunch of morons. She reused arguments such as, oh, we banned these guns, but there are other available, so what's the problem? After all, who cares that your property is being taken by government for no fucking reason? So considering her attitude during the government arguments and the fact that she was way more adversarial during the closing argument of the applicants, I'm pretty sure she's going to pull a rouleau. Meaning the government has clearly broken the law because section 117.15 paragraph 2 literally says they are not allowed to reclassify willy-nilly, but government has invoked my public safety. So who the fuck cares about the restriction placed on government? It can fuck citizens whatever it wants after all. So yeah, the judge mentioned that she would probably need two months or more to give her decision. But either way, this is going to be appealed and then go all the way to the Supreme Court and we'll see what happens if we actually have elections before C21 is passed or not. So the situation is still moving because C21, like I said, is being run through. So we're gonna see what happens. Maybe the NDP will finally find its balls and who knows, maybe we'll have the nice surprise of triggering election over this law. 
who knows. Hopefully Alberta will keep a conservative majority and hopefully Daniel Smith will say fuck you feds, we're making our own rules, finally. Anyway, if you enjoyed this little rant or just want to keep following the situation, you can like, subscribe, leave a comment and I'll see you next time. Salut, bonsoir! <laughs>